Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And welcome, of course, to the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. We're here to give political education. Uh, we're here to debate. We're here to talk. We're here to share. We're here to teach. We're here to learn. And for the last few weeks, we've been talking about a lot of issues going on around the world. The biggest one that we've been talking about, of course, has been Israel and Palestine. But as African people, as black people around the diaspora, it's also important that we raise other questions that, and that we talk about other struggles going on around the world. And one of those struggles, one of the most important struggles that we have to talk about is what's going on in the Congo. And so I said, well, I know a decent amount about Congo. I know a decent amount about what's going on. I have a decent understanding, but that's not what y'all want. That's not what you all deserve. You deserve someone who has expertise, someone who's been on the front line. So I said, I'm going to bring in a brother who I know very well, uh, a brother who has been doing the work for many, many years, more than 25 years. He's been on the front line. He's been in the D.C. Beltway. He's been on the continent of Africa. And he's going to help us understand what is going on in the Congo. His name is Maurice Carney. He is the co-founder uh, and executive director of the Friends for, excuse me, Friends of the Congo. My brother, thank you so much for joining me here. Hi, it's a pleasure. Thank you for, for having us. So so talk to me, man, from at a real basic level. You know, uh, a lot of us have heard the word Congo. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a crisis. We know that there's a problem. And frankly, uh, as so many people have turned their attention to Israel and Palestine, there have been a lot of Black folk, African folk, Pan-African folk who have said, but what about Black stuff? What about Sudan? What about Haiti? And what about Congo? So... Right. What's going on in the Congo? Help, help me get some context. Sure, sure. Uh, first, uh, first and foremost, we have to make a, a, a distinction. Uh, there are two Congos. Uh, you have uh, Congo Brazzaville, or the Republic of Congo, and you have Congo Kinshasa, the Democratic Repu Republic of the Congo. Congo Brazzaville is uh, uh, probably the only country on the African continent with a capital city that still maintains the name of its uh, former colonizer. Uh, Pierre uh, Savion de, de Brazza, uh, an Italian who colonized Congo Brazzaville on behalf of the French. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's the smaller Congo. Uh, the Congo that we're talking about is the, the former Zaire, uh, the former Republic of the Congo. Uh, it's uh, a country that's located in the heart of the African continent. Uh, it straddles the equator. It's a country about the size of Western Europe. Uh, it's the uh, second largest country on the African continent in terms of area, uh, the fourth largest in terms of uh, population with an estimated uh, 100 million people. And it has a storied history. It's been uh, the Congo, that Congo region, the heart of the African continent, has been central to the 500-year journey of uh, African peoples, uh, particularly the era in which uh, our uh, esteemed um, scholar, Maureen Brani, calls uh, the, the Maafa. It is from this region in the heart of the African continent where... Um, and the Maafa is the great African Holocaust. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, from the late 1400s, uh, well, there are two pivotal periods in our history uh, that where Congo looms large. Uh, from the fort late 1400s, when Europeans began... Uh, extracting Africans from the continent, trafficking them uh, to the Americas. Uh, according to Emory University's slave, slavery database, uh, there's a website called slavevoyages.org, and uh, UNESCO, uh, almost half of the Africans that were trafficked to the Americas came from the Congo region. Uh, wow. Especially four out of 10, right? And that's documented by, by scholars at uh, Emory University, UNESCO. And as I said, people can go to slavevoyages.org to get that information. So. The, the extraction of the African from the, from the continent, the plundering, uh, the first plundering of, uh, of Africa in terms of human bodies, Congo loom large. And, wow. and again, in the second plundering of the Congo, I mean of Africa by European powers occurred uh, a few hundred years, about 400 years later, 1884, 1885 Berlin Conference, where 14 European nations, including the United States, uh, gathered to uh, basically carve up the continent, uh, establish their spheres of influence on the continent. You know, basically to say, uh, this is this great, magnificent pie, as they call it. Uh, so let's gather, you know, and, and they gathered in Berlin under Otto von Bismarck. And, it's, and they said they gathered in an effort 
not to go to war against each other, because they would go to war against each other in order to control different parts of Africa. A, a really good book for people, to, or two good books for people to consult around that era is uh, Thomas Pakenham's the, the Scramble for Africa. That's the classic right there. It's a classic. And of course, uh, uh, David Levering Lewis, uh, The Race to Fashada. As many of you may know David Levering Lewis, he's probably the foremost biographer of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, so at that conference, 1884-85 uh, conference, what happened was Congo was given to King Leopold II of Belgium as his own personal property, his private property. It wasn't colonized at that time. And the king ruled Congo for about 23 years, uh, from 1885 to 1908. And within that 23-year period, uh, the Congolese population was decimated by half, right? Mm. Estimated 10 million Congolese perished as the king extracted rubber and ivory uh, to fuel Western industry. Uh, this is well documented by Adam Hochschild's book, uh, King Leopold's uh, Ghost. Uh, and it, there was such an outcry that the king had to, to give up the, 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 the Congo uh, at, in 1908. Uh, I think he got about a billion dollars in today's uh, money for, for that, for the giving of the Congo. And that wow. international outcry, a large part of it was led by African Americans, right? In terms of the anti-colonial solidarity uh, that took place uh, to resist uh, the uh, ownership of the Congo and the, the atrocities that were committed in the Congo by King Leopold II. You had figures like William Shepard, who was a Presbyterian minister, uh, Sister Lucy Gant, another African-American. Uh, probably mo one of the most notable African-Americans uh, is uh, George Washington Williams. Uh, he is uh, often described as the first African-American historian of note. But uh, George Washington Williams went to the Congo in 1890. Now, this is a, a Civil War hero, right? Uh, served in the Ohio legis state legislature, actually went to university at Howard and another university. And uh, when he, uh, he wrote a letter to the king about what was happening in the, in the Congo, and he says, for all intents and purposes, what's taking place here are crimes against humanity. Mm. So we had African-Americans. What, uh, year, what year is this? Get, just give me, what year is this where, the, where the, that determination was? 1890. 1890, okay. 1890 is when he, he went. And uh, another uh, great historian uh, of ours, John Hope Franklin, wrote an amazing book on George Washington Williams called The Biography of George Washington Williams. So uh, even uh, figures like uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, Booker T. Washington was a member of the uh, advocacy organization uh, at that time, which is similar to Friends of the Congo today, Congo Reform Association. And Booker T. Washington wrote a piece called Savagery in the Congo, talking about King Leopold's uh, rule in the Congo. And as a result of uh, African-American advocacy, uh, documentation by African-Americans who were on the ground uh, in the Congo, uh, people like Mark Twain uh, picked up what was unfolding and he wrote King Leopold's soliloquy, uh, basically a satirical work on, on King Leopold. So at the dawn of the 20th century, uh, the global movement, uh, human rights movement, uh, was around the Congo. Uh, now, a critical thing happened at this time when uh, the king gave up the Congo uh, mark in 1908. Congo was not turned over to the Congolese people. It was then turned over to the Belgian state. And then Belgium ruled Congo from 1908 to 1960 as a colonial outpost, right? So the resistance now, continued. Was there, was there an official title? I, I know with in the Middle East, uh, Around that time, you saw similar things happening. There was a scramble for the Middle East. They were dividing up, you know, uh, the Dutch, but more so the French and 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 the uh, really the French and the British were dividing it up. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said these are protectorates or these are mandates. Right. They were saying that we will get you to democracy, but you're going to need a period of time. Uh, in Africa, we saw some protectorates. Obviously, we saw in Egypt at one point, it, 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 the British protectorate. We saw Southeast Africa uh, or Southwest Africa. We saw the Dutch. Uh, what was happening in Congo? Did they Was it like the Bel Belgium was just going to have it? Or did they even, did they pretend to uh, be creating a process to transfer it to the indigenous people? Oh, no, no. There, there is a, you know, you had to understand the desires and aspirations of Europeans was to have colonies. Uh, so it wasn't a, a question of, uh, a transfer uh, to, to the Congolese people. Even when that question of transfer to Congolese people came later on, like in around 1955 or so, they, what the, the Belgians put on the table, uh, which was considered radical at the time, was called the Van Bilsen Plan, was a 30-year transition. So by 1985, then Congo would be turned over to the Congolese people. So, but at that time, uh, as you know, uh, 
uh, you had uh, Pan-Africanists, uh, particularly the 1900 Pan-African Conference led by Henry Sylvester Williams out of Trinidad. And they were uh, making an argument for the, the African states to be, to be eventually turned over. Right? That was one of the main, uh, main demands coming out of the London Conference in, in 1900 with uh, W.E.B. E. Du Bois. That's where you, you have the famous statement coming from W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the challenge of the 20th century is the challenge of the color line. People often locate that in the souls of black folks, but that's coming out of a pan-African uh, vision that uh, Du Bois uh, would lay, lay down, and he would later go on you know, to organize a series of pan-African Congresses, which are, are really which, which are really relevant to this discussion that you put on the table in terms of uh, our positioning as Black folks vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Palestine, because if you track this the the series of Pan African Congresses that took place in the early to mid 1900s, culminating in the 1945 Manchester Conference, uh, one of the key things that came out of proceedings of, of that conference was this notion of internationalism and being in solidarity with poor and oppressed people throughout the globe. So if you are uh, ensconced in the pan-African tradition, you can't help but be in solidarity with Palestine. There's just no debate there. Uh, you, it's not a, a dichotomous view. It's not either you are with Africa or you're with uh, Palestine. Uh, by virtue of you being a pan-Africanist, and if you subscribe to, you know, to Du Bois, uh, to Nkrumah, to uh, Amy Ashford Garvey, uh, all of them were at the 45 Manchester uh, Congress, then, uh, then you would naturally be in solidarity with, uh, with, with Palestine. Uh, so that's not really not an issue of debate uh, for Pan-Africanists. But in any case, with, with the Congo, uh, Congo got its independence uh, in 1960, uh, elected uh, Patrice Lumumba, the democratically, first democratically elected prime minister uh, of the Congo. And uh, at that point, we see uh, the greatest, uh, the first intervention on the part of the United States on the African continent in terms of post-independence uh, Africa. And the Congo, uh, according to uh, uh, declassified documents from the State Department, was the largest covert action that the United States mounted in the 1960s, uh, was the effort to depose uh, the Democrat, democratically elected prime minister of, uh, of the Congo. And uh, the, that, that leader was uh, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, he was elected in uh, on June, or inaugurated on June 30th, uh, 19, uh, 1960. And within a matter of days, uh, we found that uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, led by its uh, chief of station, Larry Devlin, uh, you, the, the Belgians, uh, uh, British, uh, they all started to, to plot against uh, Lumumba in an effort to, uh, uh, to overthrow him. And they were successful in overthrowing Lumumba. And they overthrew Lumumba, uh, which ultimately led to his uh, assassination uh, on January 17, uh, 1961. Uh, so within uh, a seven-month period, uh, Lumumba was uh, assassinated. And the chief of station, uh, Larry Devlin, he, he wrote a book with that title, Chief of Station Congo, and he said that we had to overthrow uh, Lumumba because if we didn't overthrow Lumumba, not only would we have lost uh, mm. Congo, but we would have lost all of Africa. And this is a really important uh, period and, and statement that, that Devlin makes because what you find is that both uh, Congo's friends and Congo's foes uh, recognize the centrality of Congo uh, to the African continent uh, as a whole. Uh, that it's, uh, it's pivotal. On the one hand, you had Devlin uh, trying to overthrow uh, Lumumba and successfully overthrow Lumumba. On the other hand, you had the Pan-Africanists. You had uh, Kwame Nkrumah of, uh, of Ghana. You had Sekou Toure of uh, Guinea. Uh, had figures like Modiba Keita of uh, Mali. And these figures saw Congo as central to the Pan-African project, uh, the United States of Africa. In fact, uh, Nkrumah wrote a book uh, entitled The Challenge of the Congo, uh, where in that book he lays out uh, the agreement that he had with Lumumba, where Congo would serve as the capital of the United States of Africa. And they dispatched uh, a series, uh, a number of, uh, of figures, a uh, great Pan-Africanist woman by the name of Andre Blouin, 
uh, Felix Moumier out of Cameroon to go work with Lumumba in an effort uh, to fully uh, bring the Congo into that Pan-African project. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we're going right back from slavery uh, to uh, Berlin Conference, to the independence era, Congo has been central in the project of uh, whether it's a question of uh, plunder, plunder of the, the continent or an effort by Africans to develop and advance uh, the continent, uh, Congo looms large, right? Absolutely. Even Absolutely. I mean, that, that's such an important point. Everybody, I hope you're uh, joining us from the beginning, but if not, I have my dear brother here, uh, Maurice Carney, who is from uh, my perspective, one of the most important voices and one of the most knowledgeable minds on Congo. And he's been breaking down from the times of the Maafa, from the times of the awful African Holocaust, the African slave trade from back then, uh, all the way up to Berlin Conference, the scramble for Africa. He's been explaining to us how Congo has been a centerpiece of struggle. It's been a contested territory. It's been a site of colonial violence. Uh, it's also been a, a site of possibility for Pan-African uh, political imaginations and it's been lots of things to lots of people we're going to keep talking to them but i want to make sure y'all hit the subscribe button this is the stuff we do on this channel this is the stuff we do it's not uh just debates it's not just political conversation this is education this is community education it's free of charge all i ask you to do is hit that subscribe button and spread the word about what we're doing also if you want to hit the join button join the mlh family right now we've seen people do it already shout out to anthony shannon for for sharing uh, with us, uh, a, 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 a super chat, uh, family royalty. Thank you for joining the MLH fam. I'm so grateful to you for that. Uh, and we got so many other people who have recently joined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my brother, let me, let me ask you then. So we have that context, right? Which is a familiar one in Africa and Latin America and the Middle East, pretty much anywhere where <laughs> non-Europeans are, mm -hmm. we, we often see uh, imperialism, we see exploitation, we see extraction, we see plunder, we see struggle for independence. And even when there's an independent moment, uh, they never stop meddling, right? right. Europe never stops in, in involving itself. It never stops underdeveloping, to use Walter Rodney's language. Mm -hmm. So with all that going on, how do we get from an independent struggle and Patrice Lumumba to a moment right now where people are saying we're in the greatest humanitarian crisis uh, maybe in the world and, and maybe in modern history. What is going on in the Congo? Yeah, so uh, right now, uh, what's uh, unfolding in the Congo, when you talk about the greatest humanitarian crisis, uh, you really have to go back to 1996. Uh, and in 1996, uh, represented, uh, that's about three decades uh, after the U.S. overthrew uh, Lumumba, uh, they installed uh, Mobutu, uh, Joseph Desiree Mobutu. And th there's a there's a uh, author just recently published a book uh, called The Lumumba Plot, uh, Stuart Reed. And uh, he said that uh, the CIA uh, had blood on its, its hands for, for the death of, of, of Lumumba. And it played a role in every event leading up to Lumumba's down, downfall and the installation of Mobutu. So by the time we get to 1996 or so, Mobutu is getting old. Uh, it was at the end of the Cold War. It was after the Cold War. And the United States really wanted to get rid of Mobutu. Uh, but they made a crucial decision, uh, US policymakers. Uh, instead of uh, supporting a burgeoning pro-democracy movement uh, that uh, came about as a result of the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s. You had Congolese, they had what they called the National Sovereign Conference in 1992, where it's basically a mass democratic effort to get rid of the dictator and institute a, uh, a system of democracy. Uh, but what the United States did uh, instead, in an effort to get rid of Mobutu, they backed the invasion of the Congo by two of Congo's neighbors, uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda, Yari Museveni of Uganda, and Burundi joined at the time and also Angola was a part of it for its own strategic reasons. Because in Angola, the Santos, they were fighting against UNITA and Jonas Savimbi. And the lifeline to Jonas Savimbi from the CIA and the United States uh, was uh, Mobutu in the Congo. So Angola had an interest in getting rid of Mobutu. So they joined the, the, uh, the, the war against uh, Mobutu as well. And Mobutu uh, was ultimately overthrown in 1997. And Lauren Desiree Kabila was, in, was installed. 
uh, by, uh, he didn't have an army of his own. Uh, he was primarily propped up by Rwanda and Uganda. Not only was uh, uh, Desert Kabila installed, but also the Rwandans installed the head of the military, one of their own, a gentleman by the name of James Kabarebi, who's currently the foreign minister of Rwanda. So Rwanda wanted to control uh, Kabila and the Congo. And Kabila tried to shake him off. Uh, so what he did was he reached out to uh, his allies in uh, Southern Africa, because uh, Congo under Kabila had joined the Southern African Development Community. Uh, so in reaching out to, to Southern uh, allies uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, they came into the Congo in 1998 uh, to fight the US and UK backed Rwanda and, and Uganda. And it's this 1998 uh, conflict that triggered uh, the 5.4 million uh, dead that the International Rescue Committee uh, puts out there. So from 1996 to about 2007 or so, we see an estimated 6 million Congolese perishing, uh, primarily that, that's because, a because of the conflict. Say that, say that again. I don't want people to lose sight. Sometimes when we hear numbers and they, you know, they, they, they we kind of get lost in the, you know, in, in the, in the sea of statistics. But say, from 19, for over an 11 year period, say that period again. Yeah. From 1996 to about 2007. Right. Yeah. The 1996 to 1998 war, which is the first war. And then the 1998 war, which many people dub uh, the great African war because there are 11 countries involved. Uh, but right. the main, uh, uh, protagonists were Rwanda and Uganda, backed by the United States and the United Kingdom, and then the Southern African Development Community. And they wound up beating back Rwanda, so Rwanda was not able to overthrow Kabila, whom they had installed. And during that period, uh, you had an estimated 6 million Congolese that perished, uh, primarily from conflict-related causes. That is to say, you know, uh, hunger, uh, diseases, because they were driven into, into the forest and couldn't survive. And half of those, half of those who perish are children under the age of five. So that's why the United Nations uh, dubbed it as the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. And uh, the peace, uh, there was a peace agreement that was established in 2002. And uh, that peace agreement resulted in Rwanda who, 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 and Uganda. Who broke the peace agreement? Who brokered the peace agreement? Uh, the, the United Nations brokered the peace agreement. Uh, they uh, worked with, uh, you know, the, the U.S. and other Western powers where because the Rwanda and Uganda then occupied uh, the eastern part uh, of the Congo and they uh, they were being pushed to give up the parts of the Congo that uh, that they occupied and they ultimately had to give up the parts of the Congo that they occupied. However, that didn't end the conflict because what uh, Rwanda and Uganda then decided to do was to sponsor militia groups in the Congo, right? A series of, uh, of militia groups in the Congo. Uh, National Congress for the Defense of the People is one of the early ones, CNDP. And these militia groups morphed, they, they basically remained the same, but they took on different names, right? Mm. Uh, first, it was the Alliance for, uh, of Democratic Forces for the Liberation uh, of Congo. Then you had uh, uh, National Congress for the Defense of the People. And then you, know, you have the M23. They have a, a lineage that goes uh, back to Rwanda and Uganda. And Rwanda and Uganda, uh, they've, for all intents and purposes, waged a 25-year war of aggression and plunder against uh, the Congolese uh, people. Uh, in fact, the United Nations uh, did about four studies from 2001 to 2002, uh, looking at the illicit exploitation of the Congo, where they listed some 85 international uh, companies uh, that they claimed that uh, violated uh, laws as it relates to uh, natural resource extraction in the Congo. And in those studies, they identified uh, Yari Museveni of Uganda and Paul Kagame of Rwanda as the godfathers of the illicit exploitation of the Congo's minerals. Now, they, they were middlemen because they're not processing those, uh, those minerals. They're, they're selling them off to uh, multinational corporations. So Rwanda and Uganda uh, benefited from uh, Congo's minerals, benefited from the instability. In fact, Mark, they even fought each other on Congolese soil in 2000 in what they dubbed the Six Day War, right? The other Six Day War, the right? Six Day War, uh, where they fought each other. <clears throat> they killed about a thousand Congolese in that battle and wow. uh, injured scores, right? So uh, this, this, this is an important piece too, because you know historically when we talk about obviously struggle in Africa in the 1800s and the 1900s, we're often talking about European influence, we're talking about European domination. 
But now there's a moment in, in the middle part and late part of the 20th century where we're also talking about intra um, African. Yeah. Like, I mean, and, and, I mean that's a that's a really critical point. I mean, that's a huge point because recall I shared with you uh, coming out of the All African People's Conference in 1958 in Accra, where you had Nkrumah, Frantz Fanon, uh, just a major figures, right? Uh, Pan African figures who were in the independence struggle. What they did was they gathered to support the Congo, right? The Pan Africanists gathered to support the Congo, embrace the Congo, send uh, send uh, uh, you know uh, other Pan Africanists uh, to to be with Mobutu. I'm sorry, with, uh, with Lumumba, right? Now, what we have today is we have these uh, neighboring countries, these leaders who are plundering the Congo. In fact, Yari Museveni said, Congo is like a banana plantation. You go in and get what you want, right? Wow. Now, they, they couldn't, right? They couldn't do what they're doing and get away with it without the backing of the United States, right? The United States has armed them, United States has financed them. United States has provided intelligence uh, uh, for them, equipment, and, and so, so, when- Let me pause you for a second, just for clarity's sake. And everybody, again, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button if you're enjoying this conversation, if you're learning what's going on, if, you, if you're growing and developing intellectually, if, you, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the, the, the whistles are going off in your brain about making connections like they are for me right now, uh, hit that like button, make sure you subscribe. Um, you say the U.S. supported them, gave them weapons. First of all, who is the them? And secondly, why is the U.S. doing that? Uh, there, are two, there are two lead proxies. There are two allies. Them meaning uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yaru Museveni of Uganda. Uh, you see, in, uh, in 1998, under the Clinton administration, uh, he had made a trip to, uh, to, uh, to Africa. And coming out of that trip, uh, they established what they call the Entebbe principles, right? You can do a Google, the, your audience can Google, just Google Entebbe, it's Entebbe Uganda. They call it the Entebbe principles. And on, in the Entebbe principles, what they did, the United States did, was they identified what they call a new breed of African leaders, right? Renaissance leaders, right? And the figures such as uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda came in that camp, Yeru Museveni of Uganda, right? Meles Zanawi of Ethiopia fell in that camp. And the interesting thing is these figures that the United States put its, its stamp on, its imprimatur on, right? They had certain things in common. They're authoritarian figures. They had the blood of millions of Africans on their, on their hands. Uh, they invaded other countries, right? But because the U.S. is such a, a juggernaut, it's, a, it's the dominant, you know, we're talking about a unipolar world right now, and if you have that stamp on the, by, of the U.S. on you, then you get a free pass, right? So right. They, there are international institutions that try to hold the, the Kagamis and the Museveni's accountable for the crimes that they committed in the Congo, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity. Uh, in fact, the International Court of Justice in 2005 ruled that Uganda owed Congo billions of dollars in reparations for the plunder of the Congo, for the crimes that it committed. It would have done the same thing against uh, uh, Rwanda, but Rwanda was not party to the International uh, Court of Justice. So you have these inter international institutions that are trying to hold these, these guys accountable for the crimes that they've committed. Uh, but we find what we find is, because they're, they're the new breed of leaders, the Renaissance leaders, which at the time, Madeleine Albright was the Secretary of State on the Clinton, uh, Susan Rice was the Assistant Secretary of State, and they would run interference, uh, prevent anything from uh, uh, any accountability on the on the part of the a part of these leaders. These uh, renaissance when, leaders. these renaissance leaders. I mean, is it too cynical to say that they were just bought and paid for U.S. puppets who had some of whom had been trained no, in the West? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. They're uh, agents of neocolonialism. You know, uh, not that it's a huge deal. Paul Kagame himself was at Fort Leavenworth. He was trained in Fort Leavenworth. Uh, the, uh, his children, you know, uh, went, went to West Point, Paul Kagame, uh, Yaru wow. Museveni, his son graduated from Fort Leavenworth. So they're, they're, they're embedded with the U.S. When the U.S. Uh, invaded uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, they provide soldiers, especially Uganda, to go into uh, Afghan, uh, to, to Iraq with, uh, with U.S. soldiers. So they, they're very much uh, a part of the, the U.S., military industrial system. It's uh, the, the Pentagon, the intelligence system. Uh, AFRICOM, when AFRICOM, the Africa Command uh, was established in, in 2008 by Donald Rumsfeld 
and uh, uh, George Bush. Uh, you know, Rwanda was on, uh, uh, on the list as a, a beneficiary of AFRICOM. In fact, when President Obama himself came into power, who did the most of any president to accelerate AFRICOM, the military footprint on Africa increased some 2,000% under Obama. Uh, one of the first things he did uh, when he, in, uh, in 2009, uh, when, he was, uh, when he assumed, uh, when he was inaugurated, uh, was to send a delivery of weapons equipment to, uh, to Rwanda, right? So wow. these, these, these uh, quote unquote Renaissance leaders, uh, uh, new breed of African leaders, uh, for all intents and purposes, are agents, agents of neocolonialism. They, they push uh, neoliberal policies. Uh, they do in Africa, uh, they provide, their, they farm out their militaries uh, to do what US, uh, US uh, doesn't necessarily want its, its troops to do. And, and Rwanda is a master of this, right? Of all the countries in Africa, Rwanda provides uh, the most uh, soldiers, troops, to United uh, Nations uh, peacekeeping missions. Uh, if uh, the, uh, there are certain, if, if for example, if you recently in, uh, in uh, Mozambique, uh, there's been uh, uprisings in Mozambique, rebel movement, and it's threatened uh, French oil interests. Uh, total oil. It's, it's natural gas fields in Mozambique. So the French, what the French uh, did, Macron reached out to Kagame, and then Kagame farmed out his uh, his soldiers to go into Mozambique to combat uh, militant groups on behalf of the French and on behalf of Total. So he's, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, his his military is a mercenary force. So. Uh, not, not only do they, it's not only on the, uh, the military front that Rwanda serves uh, the West's uh, interests. Uh, you, you probably, some of you probably read recently where the United Kingdom, where England was trying to traffic immigrants or refugees that came into England for, uh, you know, for, for support uh, to, to get uh, to status. They had an agreement with Rwanda where they would send uh, uh, those immigrants to Rwanda instead of having them be in, uh, in England. And even before that, from 2013, hey, where they would send, uh, from 2013 to 20, uh, 2018, you had some 4,000 uh, immigrants or refugees that had tried to get into Israel. And Kagame worked out with Netanyahu where uh, those refugees would then be sent to, uh, sent to, to Rwanda, right? Uh, so Rwanda has been at, uh, he, the, Paul Kagame is an expert at uh, playing the game of being a service uh, to, to the empire. And that's what uh, we've, uh, uh, we've seen from him uh, over the years. Even with Israel, uh, they have really close ties. Uh, I don't know if you recall the, uh, the controversy a few years ago around the Pegasus. Uh, yes, so, uh, so, me, that's, a, that's, a great, that's another great segue. And I, I want to ask you about Israel because, uh, again, one of the things that people have said is, I don't have time to worry about Israel-Palestine. I'm worried about what's going on in Africa. I'm worried about what's going on around the, the uh, diaspora as a Pan-Africanist. Uh, our dear brother, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson, was one of those people who made a video uh, where he was saying, you know, I don't want any bloodshed, I don't want any pain, I don't want any bad things to happen to Arab brothers and sisters in the West Bank or in Gaza, but I have to worry about African people, I have to worry about my business here, and I have to worry about uh, what's going on to African people around uh, the globe. And one of the places that he pointed to was Congo. Mm. Uh, some people, like uh, Susan Abul Hawa, who is a prominent uh, Palestinian activist, uh, pointed out the relationship between Congo and Israel. To say, as it, that is to say, that they're not separate issues, and that we have to kind of think about the overlap and how we're all linked, uh, not just as oppressed people, but by particular systems, particular states, particular forces. Could you talk a little bit about? Uh, the role of Israel in the Congo? Yeah, uh, well, Israel had been a long time uh, ally of, uh, of Mobutu, the dictator, in terms of uh, training its soldiers. Uh, it's been, you know, uh, deeply uh, engaged uh, in, in the Congo uh, in terms of uh, getting access uh, to its, uh, its riches, particularly uh, the diamonds. Uh, you know, the uh, Congolese, uh, it's a religious uh, um, society, when uh, the current Congolese president Felix uh, Tshisekedi uh, first came to the, the or came to the United States as president, uh, I think it was 2019, 2020, maybe in 2019, uh, he spoke at APAC, right, uh, American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, and uh, that's where he went to went to speak. 
Uh, so uh, they, they, there is a, a strong tie right now as we speak because of what's happening in, uh, in Gaza, the uh, Israeli uh, soldiers that were training uh, Congolese soldiers in their battle against the M23 had to be called back to, to Israel because they needed them in Israel so that they could fight uh, in Gaza. Uh, so there are, at this very moment, they were training, uh, training Congolese, uh, uh, Congolese military. Uh, so that's on the military front, but on the economic front, there are deep ties. Well, let me, let me ask let me, let me ask a couple clarifying questions about military, uh, just so that I understand from my own my own knowledge. Is it accurate to say that Israel has trained uh, Ugandan and Rwandan militia groups? Is, is that a fair uh, assessment? I don't know if you say trained. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen uh, to train Rwandan and Ugandan militia groups. Uh, that I haven't seen the evidence of that. Okay. You know, I'm I just haven't seen it. They may have, I, don't know. I don't know enough. I'll be right. honest with you. I, I know they, they, they train their soldiers, right? But I don't know if they train the militia groups. Oh, right? okay. No, but this right. is helpful. These, these distinctions are important. Again, yeah. I don't know enough. That's why I brought an expert on. Yeah. So it, it, you would say it's a, it, it is, uh, you've seen no evidence that they're training militia groups, but they are training Ugandan and Rwandan soldiers. Uh, Rwandan, Ugandan, uh, Congolese. <laughs> they train, they, that's one of the services they provide in training their, their soldiers. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that I've been told, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a note that someone uh, sent to me. They said Israel was also the only country supplying weapons to the Hutus when the whole world knew they were massacring Tutsis. Uh, is, do you, I, I don't, I haven't seen that. Your, no, no, I no problem at all. Seen, I haven't seen that. Okay. I haven't seen that. No. that, that that's important. Again, I don't yeah. ever want to overstate what's happening. No, no, and we don't, we don't need to over, we don't need to overstate it. Uh, you know, Israeli engagement in Africa uh, has been devastating. You just have to look at the history of uh, apartheid South Africa and uh, how Israel worked with uh, South Africa to help them develop nuclear weapons, worked with uh, South African military. So uh, whether it's in South Africa, different parts of uh, the continent, and uh, equally important are the business people. The, uh, the rich, one of the richest individuals in the Congo is an Israeli by the name of Dan Gertler. Uh, he, uh, he, he, kind, he, he took over, let's say, uh, from Maurice Templesman. Some of you may rem remember Maurice Templesman, uh, the uh, Democratic uh, supporter, the concert of uh, Jacqueline uh, Kennedy Onassis. They, uh, he worked closely with Mobutu to get access to the diamonds uh, that were then, you know, ex shifted out of the Congo and sold in, in New York and Israel and elsewhere. So Dan Gertler, an Israeli, uh, conservative Israeli, uh, who uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Jew, uh, who uh, struck up a relationship with Congress President Joseph Kabila. First, he had access to diamonds, uh, and then he uh, got access to, to, to minerals, uh, copper, and, and then oil. Just He became a billionaire off, uh, off the Congo. He worked with a, a partner by the name of Benny Steinmetz, uh, who incidentally was just uh, uh, charged, and I think even convicted for uh, illicit activities in, in Guinea. Uh, but the two of them established a company uh, that where they got control of uh, concessions in the Congo, and they took that company to uh, the London uh, alternative uh, investment market uh, in order to uh, issue a public uh, tender. And they, it was the company was valued at uh, billions of dollars just from that mm -hmm. one company saying that they have uh, concessions in the Congo, uh, which was at the time was even greater than uh, than Congo's uh, annual budget. Uh, but he's become a, a billionaire off of the Congo. Uh, he's uh, currently on the U.S. sanctions list uh, because of uh, uh, illicit operations, uh, corrupt operations. Uh, he was uh, identified as being part of an effort with a Wall Street firm called Och Ziff. I think they've changed their name now. But that was mm -hmm. filed by the, uh, fined by the Justice Department, hundreds of millions of dollars for uh, corrupting uh, Congolese officials. Uh, so, which is really critical because when you talk about corruption, you usually look at the the African leaders, but here it is that you have a hedge fund on Wall Street who basically had a slush fund that they gave to Dan Gertler uh, in order for him to corrupt uh, Congolese officials uh, to get uh, sweetheart deals, uh, mining, uh, mining concessions. And uh, Gertler worked it so well, uh, uh, Mark, that uh, today we have a situation, even though he's on the U.S. sanctions list, uh, because of his relationship with a major mining company uh, called Glencore, Glencore is a mining company in the Congo, uh, that was actually formed by, by Mark Rich. Uh, some of you may remember Mark Rich. He's the one that got a pardon from Bill Clinton going out the door 
uh, of his presidency, uh, Glencore uh, is uh, in partnership with, uh, with, uh, with Dan Gertler. And Gertler uh, currently gets, according to an article by Vanity Fair, $200,000 a day in royalties from Glencore, even though he's, uh, he's under sanctions. Now, wow. to put that in perspective for people, according to the World Bank, seven out of 10 Congolese, 70 million of the 100 million Congolese live on less than $2.15 a day, right? So one man, Dan Gertler, is really I need again hundred thousand dollars a day. I need to slow that down because again, seventy million people, price, and not just to the, the 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 gross disparity, but also to the conditions that kind of Congolese people are living under. Say that again. Say that, say that again. That's, uh, according to the World Bank, seventy percent of Congolese live on less than two dollars and fifteen cents a day. You know, we're talking about a, a country where the gross domestic product is about fifty billion dollars or so. The per capita income is about five hundred dollars a year. Uh, it's a country that's really being plundered. And that, that's, uh, you know, for, for those who have been following us uh, all along, that's the fundamental theme uh, of the Congo. Like the Congo was designed by Europeans for plunder, for the extraction of, uh, of minerals. And that design uh, has not fundamentally changed to this very day, uh, where you see the, the resources going out of the Congo while right. the Congolese people live in abject poverty. Uh, and Congolese scholar, Dr. George Nzangola and Talaja uh, wrote a, an excellent book called Congo from Leopold to Kabila, where mm. he, he, it's a people's history of the, the Congo. It's like the Howard Zinn corollary of the Congo, right? Uh, where he, he tracks, he documents the resistance on the part of the Congolese, uh, the pursuit of Congolese in order to control and determine their own affairs. And that's really the central struggle of the Congolese. Uh, mm. For those who are just coming into uh, the free Congo movement, learning about the Congo, at the heart of the matter, and when you're talking about liberation, when you're talking about finally achieving uh, that sovereignty, it's that struggle on the part of Congolese. And that's what Friends of the Congo uh, does. We, we support the Congolese in that, uh, in that struggle for control, Self-determination determination of their own yeah. affairs, right? Let me ask you a question, because I, I see a, a question is coming up here uh, that's really interesting. And again, we talked about the role of Israel in the Congo. Uh, we've talked about the role of the United States in the Congo. We could add the British and the French to the Congo as well at various moments, having uh, a, a, plund a plunderous or extractive relationship. Again, it's not just Israel. It's lots of Western nations and their clients. Uh, but there's a question that comes up here. Uh, from Mehdi Ahmadi, who's a, a member of the MLA's channel. Shout out to Mehdi. Uh, he said, is Chinese influence in the Congo likely to continue as is or might it become more positive in the future? And I've seen this in Tanz Tanzania. I've seen this in other parts of the continent. I'm seeing a bigger uh, influence of India and a bigger influence of China. Uh, how are they playing out in the Congo? Uh, to answer his, his question uh, short, yes, uh, Chinese influence. Uh, will uh, become uh, will either remain the same, remain the same, or become uh, uh, bigger. And 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 I know people put the Chinese question uh, on the table. Uh, in fact, right now uh, there's a, a congressman from uh, from New, New Jersey. Uh, I forget his name, Chris. Uh, uh, I'll get his name, but he has a bill uh, in the uh, in the Congress uh, to con combat Chinese influence in the in the Congo. Uh, there are actually two bills in the, in the Congress that deals with, with mining, and that's tied to Chinese influence. Chris in Smith. The U.S. Uh, the, there's uh, uh, Chris Smith. Chris, Chris Smith. Smith. Yep. Chris Smith out of uh, out a of Republican, uh, New by Jersey. the way, a, a Republican out of New Jersey. A Republican out of New Jersey. That's right. Uh, and there's uh, uh, another uh, Black Republican out of uh, out of Michigan, John James. He's got a bill as well. So. Basically, what you have uh, in the Chinese part is really is, is particularly interesting because they, they have control of the, the majority of the mines in the, in the Congo today. Uh, now, that's really 20 years ago or so in 2001, when the United Nations listed the companies that were involved in the Congo, there was only one Chinese company on that list of the yeah. 85. And they weren't even a mining, co mining company. Uh, but today, uh, as a result of... Uh, uh, Chinese industrialization, the, the need for copper, which Congo has uh, in droves and the best quality, need for cobalt. Uh, uh, China, China uh, processes about 80% of the cobalt uh, uh, that, uh, in, in the world. So you had the Chinese establishing a deal with the Congolese government in about 2008, 2009, 
uh, a nine billion dollar uh, minerals for infrastructure swap, right? Where uh, Chinese would get access to the copper, the cobalt, and other minerals, and the Congolese would get roads, uh, hospitals, schools. Now, this didn't sit too well uh, with the U.S. and the multilateral institutions. So the, the World Bank jumped in and said, you know, you can't do that deal. That deal can't go through. <laughs> uh, so there was a battle that, uh, that ensued. You had the Chinese uh, in the Financial Times accusing the, the U.S. and the West of blackmailing the Congolese. Uh, the World Bank said to the Congolese government, listen, we ha you have an $11 billion debt. We're not going to retire that debt if you go through the deal. Uh, you need $600 million to run your government. You're not going to get the $600 million to run your government, to go through the deal. So the Congolese had to renegotiate the deal, and they brought it down to, to $6 billion, right? Mm. Uh, so uh, you have uh, this geostrategic battle taking place in the Congo around the Chinese uh, being there. But it's really interesting. We have these members of Congress today who are putting bills and saying that because of uh, the, uh, the need, our transition uh, to, uh, from combustion engine to electric vehicles, we need to get access and control to the cobalt in, in the Congo, those minerals. Congo produces 70% of the world's cobalt, uh, a mineral that's indispensable to the clean energy or the green energy uh, transition. Uh, so you have these uh, members of Congress saying we need to get control and of that. But what's, what's really interesting, uh, uh, Mark, is that there was an American company that had the largest uh, copper mine in the, in, the, in the Congo. It's called Freeport McMorrin out of uh, Arizona. Uh, and, you know, both John McCain and his wife are tied with that company. In fact, McCain's wife was involved in the Congo uh, as well. Really? But the, the, uh, and, and still is in humanitarian projects working with Congolese uh, in, the, uh, in the east of the Congo with, uh, with uh, I think, in, in collaboration with Ben Affleck. Um, they have what they call the Eastern Congo Initiative. Uh, so are, are these are these good natured interventions? Like, are they actually just trying to make do like there were people, for example, in Haiti after the earthquake? It was like, OK, mm. some of y'all want to do humanitarian work. Some of y'all just want to repatriate all the resources to the states. When I see the Ben Afflecks of the world, when I see the different uh, athletes, actors, philanthropists, etc. in Congo, my antenna goes up for all the historic reasons. And I wonder, is this well-intended work? Is it actually good uh, interventions they're making? Or is it like well-intentioned but bad? Like what's what's going on with that? It, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix. Okay. So I'll give you three figures and, and, and break them down. So you have Ben Affleck, uh, Eastern Congo Initiative. Uh, what he did was he actually consulted with the Congolese uh, and identified organizations that were doing good work and sought to invest in those organizations. Uh, he had some, uh, how can I say, uh, complicated relationship with, with Rwanda, uh, which we don't have to get into, which may, which I make things. Rosado. I do want to know that. We can talk about it later, but I no, do want Which to... makes things uh, interesting. But, um, but then you also have a figure like uh, uh, Howard Buffett. He's the son of Warren Buffett, right? Uh, the, the, the billionaire. And he's invested about $140 million in Eastern Congo and Rwanda. Wow. And he's really tight with, uh, with Kagame. And uh, where, where we see uh, Howard Buffett, he's even ventured into the, into the politics. In 20, 2013, uh, when the uh, Obama administration uh, was castigating Kagame for supporting the M23 in the, in the Congo, and they actually did the, the Congolese, along with the United Nations, uh, and some diplomatic pressure actually defeated the M23. That was backed by Rwanda and Uganda in 2013. What we saw during the peace talks at that time, uh, Howard Buffett and Tony Blair took out a full page ad in the Washington Post mm. in support of the M23, saying that they should be uh, you know, integrated back into the Congolese military, even though they're not, a lot of them are not Congolese. Uh, but we see they, they're very much uh, in the camp of Kagame. Uh, Tony Blair is an advisor uh, to Paul Kagame. Uh, Man, the, the, bedfellows, the, the bedfellows that get made in politics, especially global politics, man, I'm always fascinated. Yes. All yes. These countries, you know what I mean? Like all these countries at one moment or another will talk about how outraged they are at this despot, this dictator, this uh, violence, this famine. And then the next minute, they'll be arm in arm with the leader of Absolutely. a different family or a different Absolutely. Family. You, and, you know, and, and that's really uh, Kagame's, uh, you know, uh, M.O. He, he's connected with Bill Clinton, the Tony Blairs, uh, the Howard Buffetts. 
you know, Howard Buffett say, you know, I wouldn't be investing in the, in the Congo, Eastern Congo and Rwanda if, if it wasn't for Kagame, you know, like, like they're tight. Uh, so you right. have those figures. And then you have like a, a, a Bezos, for example, Jeff Bezos, uh, who's uh, very much uh, engaged in the Congo uh, on the other side. Uh, as you know, uh, some of your listeners uh, or viewers may know, uh, Congo, uh, the Congo Basin, or Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world, right? Uh, which is vital in the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, right. In fact, uh, the Congo alone sequesters more carbon than all of the tropical rainforests combined, including the Amazon and Borneo, right? Wow. And it is home to the, the largest tropical peatlands, right? It, peatlands is a, is a carbon trap where uh, you know, carbon is trapped uh, in, in, the, in the soil for thousands of years of uh, sediment, you know, uh, sedimentation and uh, just it, 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 came, it, it maintains uh, uh, the cap on the, uh, on the carbon. And the carbon that's trapped in the Congo is equivalent to about 20 years of uh, U.S. Uh, pollution from the combustion engine, right? Gee. So we're talking, I know we talk about Congo's importance in terms of the future of Africa, in terms of pan-Africanism, but if you look on it on a global scale in terms of the planet, you have on the one hand where it's vital in the fight against climate crisis, right? because of the Congo Basin, and which accounts for about six countries. We're talking about Cameroon, Gabon, we're talking about Central African Republic, uh, Congo mm. Brazzaville, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea. And Congo itself, the Democratic Republic of Congo, accounts for about 60% of the Congo Basin, right? So if wow. you're talking about combating the climate crisis, which is a worldwide issues, a planetary issue. And getting worse by the day. I mean, we saw now worse by the day. day you have to talk about the Congo. And yeah. then the solution that's brought forward, right? Like we saw, you know, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, this is the largest uh, climate uh, bill that's been passed in the history of the United States, the green transition, right? The uh, clean energy transition, uh, Congo is central, uh, again, because it produces 70% of the world's cobalt. If you add up all the countries in the world that produce cobalt, they don't equal what Congo produces. And there is no green energy, energy transition without cobalt. Uh, so you have uh, Bezos, uh, with the Bezos Foundation, is investing heavily in the, in the Congo on a top-down model, right? Not necessarily the model that supports uh, the indigenous and local leaders. In fact, when you talk about funding that goes to the climate uh, advocacy and climate justice, in the region, less than 1%, right? Less than 1% get to the local population who really are the, the best custodians, right? Of the rainforest and it's biodiversity because it's for them, it's not a question of fighting climate crisis. It's a question of culture. It's a question of ancestry. It's a question of spirituality. Uh, where we're doing a film right now with a Congolese filmmaker called Basanja. Uh, Basanja is a Topoke uh, uh, principal. Uh, it's a code of ethic that mm. governs how uh, human beings live in harmony with all like, living entities. Like my for my Egypt e Egyptian center folk. Right, exactly, exactly. So it's a, it's a traditional African uh, uh, principle that uh, that's been used to protect and preserve the biodiversity. So we're trying to, uh, even though people talk about the minerals and all the wealth in the Congo, uh, there's also intellectual wealth, right? There's also knowledge and wisdom. And we're trying to bring that forth to, to the world and say, hey, you know, these are the best protectors of the uh, arguably the most important rainforest uh, on the planet. Right. So the uh, the importance of the Congo, uh, again, and just wanted to, to reiterate, uh, is it's not just a question of it being important to Africa. It's not just a question of it being important to Pan-Africanists, have I articulated, uh, but it's a question about uh, being important to the survival of the planet. Wow. Right? So if you want a reason to be involved or concerned and know about what's going on, know it'll that say, it'll say coming up in 30 days, you need to know what's happening in the Congo. Wow. So so before we go, what can we do? I, I see people talking about not buying cell phone technology, not buying new electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, help me understand why we should be doing that, if that's what we should be doing. At least tell me why people are saying that. And if that's not the answer or the only answer, tell me what else should we be doing to support Congo right now? Sure, sure. Uh, um, people are probably saying that because there's a lawsuit that was brought against uh, five uh, major tech and auto companies by uh, attorney Terry Collinsworth of the International Rights Advocates. He's brought a suit uh, against uh, Apple, uh, Tesla, uh, Dell, uh, 
uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Tesla, Dell, uh, Microsoft, and Google, Google, right, uh, for being purchasing uh, cobalt from companies in the Congo that use child labor. And that, that suit is in the, in the, on appeals in the district court of, uh, in, in D.C. And what Attorney Collinsworth uh, has uh, shared with us, that uh, we need to put pressure on these companies, right, uh, so that they can settle the suit. Uh, and they can repair the damage that's been done to the children, uh, restore the communities uh, that, have been, uh, that have been damaged. Uh, so what we've encouraged people to do is to uh, put pressure on these companies uh, per the direction of uh, Attorney Collingsworth. Uh, so for folks who want to do that, they can go to freecongo, uh, freecongo.org, and they can click on the very first link you see there is a link that will lead you to a petition uh, that you can you can sign. So that's so something, something that, uh, that, you, that you can do, right? So in terms of actions, there are really three actions that people can take on the outside. Uh, one is to, and, and they can all be found at freecongo.org. They can sign a petition uh, to put pressure on those uh, tech companies as being sued by attorney Collinsworth. Uh, they can go to freecongo.org. There'll be a petition there as well to put pressure on the US government so that they, they actually support democracy in the Congo. In 2018, the U.S. sided uh, with uh, uh, results that uh, weren't, uh, weren't accurate. Uh, they, they made a compromise, and the U.S. weighed in uh, on, the, on the side of the, the person who lost the elections. Uh, so that's important. And the third is to put pressure on Rwanda, and, and you, uh, primarily Rwanda, for its destabilizing of, of the Congo. We're calling on the U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayers, the one U.S. taxpayers going, money going to support Rwanda's destabilizing of eastern, eastern Congo. However, the most important thing, uh, Mark, uh, these are things that we can do. Uh, uh, definitely a boycott. Even if a boycott was successful, uh, the, the model is, uh, is really not uh, apropos, uh, right? Uh, we saw boycott efforts uh, in, in South Africa, uh, yeah, the, the divestment efforts, right? Uh, but even today, we see that the, the majority of the South African wealth is still controlled by a minority white. So we know right. that's not an ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, solution. So what we're saying to the people is, these are things that you can do. You can click a button, send in a postcard, write a letter. Uh, you, can, you can do that right away, right now. But ultimately, uh, we would like for you to support those groups, those organizations on the front lines in the Congo who have solutions to bring about change in the Congo. Yes. Their, their solutions just haven't been scaled, right? right. Uh, because of the forces against them. They have the local elites against them. They have neighboring countries that are invading them. They have foreign companies countries that are siding with uh, leaders that don't represent uh, their interests. You have multinational corporations against them. So we're saying with all these forces against the Congolese people, we're making an appeal to people throughout the globe, to the masses, to come to the side of the Congolese, right? In the spirit of Lumumba. Lumumba, when he was uh, uh, about to be assassinated, uh, to be killed, he wrote a letter to his wife, literally from the grave. And mm. in that, to his wife, Paul, in that letter, he said to the Congolese, he said, we're not alone. Africa, Asia, free and liberated people from every corner of the world will be found by the, side, by, the, by the side of the Congolese. So we're appealing to folks to be found at the side of the Congolese. We work with a coalition of organizations that represent about 10% of the 145 territories in the Congo uh, that reach about 2 million people. Uh, just remarkable uh, ideas and projects that they have to, uh, to bring about self-sufficiency, self-determination, and be a part of a pan-African uh, project. They're, in the, they're located in the rainforest, in the heart of the rainforest. They're located in the, in the cities, the steaming city of Kinshasa, 12, 14 million uh, people. They're located in the east, the foothills, in Goma of the volcano and the, the uh, forefront uh, of the, the epicenter of the, of the conflict. And they're also located in the mining areas. So these uh, organizations uh, work with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Friends of the Congo. And we function as a gateway to them. We bring them to the world so that people can know about them and support uh, okay. them. So they can so do that friends of the Congo.org. That's the ultimate that's what I, was ask. I, want, I want people to I want people to connect with all these organizations and support all these people, but you're doing important work and you are one of the people who makes it happen. So friendsofthecongo.org, y'all yeah. go to friendsofthecongo.org and you can connect. You can make all the connection you need with them. You can support, you can donate, you can get more information and you can start to put more pieces together. And Maurice, we're going to have you back on again, brother, because there's so much to teach us 
Uh, you have so much to teach us about this. Uh, we have so much to learn about this. I know I do. Uh, I'm going to go pick up uh, some of the books and reread them. And then I'm going to pick up some of the books you mentioned that I haven't read and read them for the first time. And hopefully everybody else will. We'll also put up a reading list of, of, of some books. Bef- before you go, you gave us five books. What are five books? Before you go, what are five books that we could read to learn about what's going on in the Congo, both throughout history and now? Uh, I would recommend uh, White Malice, White Malice by Susan Williams. Uh, that's an e- excellent, uh, excellent book. Uh, I would recommend uh, Congo from Leopold to Kabila uh, by George uh, Nzangola Entelaja. Uh, I would reckon- recommend The Assassination of Lumumba by Ludo uh, DeWitt. Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, book. Uh, I'd even recommend the recent book that, that just came out, The Lumumba Plot, by, mm. by Stuart, uh, Stuart Reed. Uh, I'd recommend the, the Lumumba Plot. And then, of course, uh, King Leopold's Ghost by Adam Hochschild. Uh, I'd recommend that uh, as well. Um, well we have a reading list on, on our website. You just go to our website, and there's a search engine. Just type in reading list, and it'll put okay. up a long list of uh, Congolese and, uh, and other authors. That sounds that sounds great, man. We're gonna check out those five. We're gonna go to your site and get even more. Maurice, thanks for hanging out with us, man. I appreciate Thank you, you Thank my brother. Thank you for having us on. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll talk to you soon, brother. All right. Be well. Everybody, that's what we're doing, man. We're having conversations like this. It's not always about the debate. It's not always about the hot takes and time. It's just about good old fashioned learning. And so this brother uh, was generous enough with his time to teach us a whole bunch. So make sure you check out the five books that he recommended. Also. Stay on this channel. Go into our classroom playlist. Go into our analysis playlist. Go into all the playlists on this channel, Mark Lamont Hill Official, because we have a lot of stuff that will help you not just understand what's going on in Congo, but will help you help you understand what's going on around the world. Also, make sure you click that subscribe button and join Mark Lamont Hill Official. We appreciate all the people who hit the super thanks and super chats, everybody who donated. Uh, whether it was a little bit or a lot, it's all a lot to us. Uh, also, join the channel. We love to build family here. And the way to build a channel that will allow us to do the work of political education, community education, knowledge sharing, all of it. We can do a Mark Lamont Hill official, but I need your help. So hit that join button and make sure you become MLH fam, whether it's bronze, silver, gold, or platinum, there's something for everybody. We make it at a, at a price point that we hope will allow everybody to join and really do the thing uh, that we want you to do, which is expand this platform and expand this family. So hit subscribe, hit join, and I'll see y'all soon. And if I don't see y'all before Thanksgiving, have a good break, have a good holiday. If you don't celebrate, get some rest. If you do, stay away from the mac and cheese. I don't care what nobody say, it's nasty. I'll talk to y'all soon. Peace.